Myself. My name is Eric Wilkie. I am privileged to work here at Oak Grove Lutheran School. I'm also privileged to have uh, two children who are attending school right now in kindergarten and first grade. Very proud to have them at Oak Grove Lutheran School. And I want to welcome you to the 110th annual dinner at Oak Grove Lutheran School. Now, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea if this is the 110th dinner or not. <laughs> but I know a lot of Lutherans, I'm guessing they ate every year. So you've got to figure we're close enough. We'll just call it good. We'll call it 110. <laughs> close enough is what I say. Well, this is just a great venue. We're excited to be here at uh, what used to be St. Mark's Lutheran Church here, and uh, I'm excited that Oak Grove is going to be one of the one of the one of the groups that gets to be here at this venue. Uh, we join the likes of uh, listen to this list, Sir Mix a Lot, <laughs> Machine Gun Kelly. Post traumatic funk syndrome. Those are just three of the acts that are going to be here. And uh, so we're going to bring a little bit of church back to this place tonight, I think. Huh, folks? Is that what we'll do? A little bit of church back. I just want to spend a couple minutes uh, just, to, just to welcome you and uh, just say a brief word here or two about uh, Oak Grove Lutheran School. One of the things you're going to hear a lot tonight is kind of a, a theme, and it's actually our theme verse for the school year. It comes from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That's our theme verse for the year, and it really speaks to what we're trying to do at Oak Grove Lutheran School. We're trying to build Christian character in our students, and we take that very seriously. But you know, I think uh, another thing that we do well is we take it a step further. In fact, if you take that verse a step further and finish it off, the last part of that verse says something very important. It says, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And I think that speaks to our goal here to also encourage the actions of our young men and women. Not just the character, but the actions. And it tells us that not enough people know Him. So how we behave and how we act is important. You know, I came across this uh, poem lately, uh, recently, and I'm not going to read the whole poem to you tonight, but it's called Maggie's Poem. And the poem was from a young girl who had had a pretty terrible life. She did not have uh, the life that many, maybe many of us have had. And she writes this poem, and one of the themes of the poem that she says throughout is she continues to say the words, Do you know? Do you understand? That you represent Jesus to me. And that's what we're trying to instill in the students at Oak Grove Lutheran School. That to those of us who do not know Him, to those of those people out there that do not know Him, we represent Jesus to them. She goes on to say that when you listen to me, when you look at me, when you speak to me, and when you act, you represent Jesus to me. Now I'll be honest, that's a little discomforting sometimes too. That's a huge burden that as Christians we have to take on. But it's an important one, one we take very seriously at Oak Grove Lutheran School. So we're building character, we're also building action. We want them to be the face, the eyes, the hands of Christ. And I think we're doing a pretty good job. And I'm proud to be a part of an organization that takes that seriously. Now I look out on this crowd and I see alumni, I see current parents, I see former parents, I see faculty, I see former faculty, I see people here who have been involved with this school for many years, and I want to thank you for being here, thank you for being part of the annual dinner. I hope 
you enjoy the evening. We're going to have a fantastic evening. I think you'll be inspired throughout the night. I hope that you see and hear something that reminds you of Christ tonight. And I hope that we do a good job in representing Him to you. Now I'd like to invite up our senior student body president, Tom Burke, to give a greeting. celebrate the mission. The mission of Oak Grove Lutheran School is to express God's love by nurturing students for academic achievement, lifelong Christian commitment, and loving service throughout the world. As a six-year student and soon-to-be graduate of Oak Grove, I can tell you with confidence they have completed the mission. I know I would not be the person I am today without the education and guidance my teachers have provided, the insight and knowledge is given to me in chapel every day, and the experiences and memories made on so many mission trips. For this, I thank Oak Grove. I also want to thank all of you. Without your commitment, your time, your treasure, and your talents, it is possible that Oak Grove may not have reached its 111th year. Thank you for your dedication to helping Oak Grove achieve its mission. Oak Grove creates the opportunity for all of us to grow as servant leaders, children of God, and students, and to contribute to the world just as all of you do. And for this, we will be forever grateful. Again, thank you for all you do for Oak Grove, and have a great evening. Enjoy our concert choir led by our director Aaron Zinter.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite up on the eighth grade student in Oprah Woodson School for our dinner prayer, Mr. Jordan Peterson. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and this chance to gather to celebrate the mission of Oak Grove Lutheran School. Thank you for the guests here with us this evening and thank you especially for the opportunity to gather here in your name to not only remember, celebrate our past, but to look towards our future. Humble our hearts, O Lord, to make us thankful for these and all of our blessings. Lord, bless this food to our nourishment and us to your continued service. In Jesus' name, amen. a video of us. Uh -huh. Famous principles table. Famous or infamous? We had to pay these guys to come. <laughs> that is what we are. That is what we are. <laughs>
the source from a number of angles. We're looking at it um, from basically the angle of action words. What does it mean that God has done something for us? But also what does it mean that um, we then in turn, because of being children of God, um, then we respond in certain ways. And so we've looked at things like um, God's love for us and then in turn our love for him and our love for others. It's really important for our students to know what it means to be a child of God. defend our faith, um, to know God, and to seek God, and to discover God. And so these are a few of the topics that we're covering um, in terms of being a child of God. But it's been an incredible blessing this year to see um, just how God is using this verse. We're just hoping and praying that um, students will each day see what it means to be a child of God. And that is what we are.
gentlemen, Miss Evelyn Gorder. If you don't recognize her, she's usually blonde. But she dyed her hair for her part as Belle in the upcoming production at Oak Grove of Beauty and the Beast, which will be around February 18th and 19th, and then the 23rd through the 26th. And if you haven't been to a theater production at Oak Grove in a while, go to one because you're in for a treat. Fantastic. So we're excited for that. Uh, before we move on, I do want to remind everyone that we do have uh, baskets on every table. And we're not going to do a formal time tonight to, uh, to, to make a gift to Oak Grove Lutheran School, but what I'd ask you to do is think about whether or not you've been inspired tonight throughout the evening and what you're going to continue to see. And if at any time you are, we'd, we'd love it if you would consider a gift to Oak Grove Lutheran School tonight. But in an effort to get you out of here before 10.30, we won't, uh, we won't spend a lot of time on that, but uh, we, do, uh, we do appreciate that many folks come to this event every year and they make a pledge uh, for their yearly gift to Oak and, and we want to thank you for that, and uh, without your help, uh, we would not be the place that we are today, so thank you so much. Next, I would like to invite up a senior from Oak Grove, Mari Aker, for some uh, reflections about Oak Grove Lutheran School. to speak about the Oak Grove mission statement from the perspective of a student. I could think of no greater example of the Oak Grove mission statement than the Oak Grove mission trips. On the past tri two trips to Guatemala, I've had the opportunity to serve, learn about the beauty of new cultures, while also taking that time to develop in my faith. Over the past two times, we've had the opportunity to work with numerous organizations. I personally fell in love with one orphanage in particular called Luz de Maria. Luz de Maria houses around 40 children, all under the age of 6. It is run almost completely by volunteers who do it out of nothing but the goodness of their hearts. One day while we were working with the children at Luz de Maria, the director of the orphanage pulled Mr. Noel and I aside to see if we would accompany her to the Guatemalan courts to pick up a new baby for the orphanage. Before we met the new baby, Francisco, she briefed us on the situation. Francisco, a couple days beforehand, had been brought into the hospital for malnutrition. Upon further investigation, they noticed bruises all over his body and noticed that his problems were far worse than just malnutrition. At only four months old, his mother and grandmother had been abusing him. The director actually handed me the baby and asked me to hold him on the car ride home. As we drove, I noticed something on his shirt, now, and almost as if it was some cool joke, he was wearing a shirt that said, Mommy loves you. It was in these moments of almost shock and confusion, and I think all of us had a moment like this on the trip, that ignited a passion in all of us to do something. A passion that only grew stronger as we met and learned about the people of Guatemala. We had the opportunity to witness so many beautiful things. Church services, different events for the Day of the Dead, a beautiful kite festival, and a Mayan market. But along with it, we also learned a lot of stories of pain and the unjust circumstances that the Guatemalan people face. Through these relationships that we built, the people became so much more than a statistic or a number, but we became people that we loved and cared about deeply. This not only did we build relationships, but we found a newfound love of service and knowledge that helped us grow in our faith. Every morning, we would spend about a half an hour in the plaza as a time to reflect on our own, and we finish every night with a devotion. In our time together, we became very open with one another on our faith. People who I barely heard even speak before said the most profound things about God and Jesus. And these things didn't have to end when we got home. Mission trips are such a small portion of the opportunities available to us at Oak Grove. We have so many opportunities to lead, serve, and better understand our faith through trips, clubs, sports, music, theater, and right in the classroom. And for all of you, I thank you. Through your support of Oak Grove, you have helped push the boundaries of our education past the classroom. You have encouraged us to serve not only in our community, but abroad. And you have provided a place that we are able to learn and worship our God openly and freely. From all the students of Oak Grove, thank you so much for the amazing gifts that you have provided for us. Thank you again.
this is a completely different environment than we've been in before. So I'm hoping that the sound system is working. Can you hear me back there? I'm, my name is Don Mervick. I am a part-time member of the Oak Grove staff. Through, actually through the auspices of my wife's generosity, Rhoda Dahl was a class in, in, the, what, in the class a few years ago. And uh, <laughs> she has been so deeply engaged with Oak Grove all of her uh, adult life that I felt very strongly that I could help and, and I'm very glad. Oak Grove has been deeply blessed by the support of many people who have included Oak Grove in their estate plans. Whatever the size of the gifts, we are grateful. We want to thank all of you who have done this. On behalf of all the students and all their families, we will benefit from the support each year of all, all, of, all of Oak Grove's future. Because and it, are all the things that are being done present time with both with investments and with the program is an investment in the future of our youth and our future teachers and so on. Rhoda and I are very glad to be legacy partners. Uh, you have a brochure on the table called a, a gift to Oak Grove and a benefit to you which describes a little bit that what we do with the legacy partners and our, our purpose is to express, of course, God's love by nurturing students for academic achievement, for Christian commitment, and for loving service throughout the world. And I'm delighted that you've heard that mission statement several times this evening already. When we find out about someone's plans to help Oak Grove in this way, we want to thank them by making them legacy partners. David Hetlin designed a beautiful artwork called the, the Bread of Life. I am the Bread of Life, on a commission from the Jens Fossum family, and this is the gift we present to each legacy partner. There are quite a large number of legacy partners in this room right now, so I'm going to not try to name you, but I'm going to ask you all, will you stand at this point? If your name is on the list of legacy partners, please stand. five who have completed their giving through Legacy Partners during the last year. Hazel Berg, Norman Lorenzen, John Audland, A. Allsgard, and Virginia Shield. I assume many of you know many of those people. Two more individuals have recently notified us, notified us that they have included Oak Grove their plans. Dr. Steve Fugelstead is the first, grew up in Moorhead and graduated from Oak Grove in 1979. He has been a physician serving in emergency rooms in the Twin Cities for many years. He follows a very challenging schedule, working 12-hour shifts at night for one month and then he switches to the uh, to daytime for another month, so he's alternating diurnal and nocturnal schedules. Uh, I would not like to try to do that. He keeps up his uh, stamina by a vigorous physical exercise program. He flies with his flying club and one of his special events is that he hosts a big Norwegian celebration for the Sutton Demai here in Moorhead at the Fugelstead home. Now I think Corky and Maine are here. Uh, is that true? Would you put up your hands if you, if you are? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you will accept this uh, plaque for on behalf of Steve and uh, present it, bring it to you after a little bit. And so that uh, since he could not be here tonight, the second person is John K. C. Ma, who is a businessman in Chicago. And he's not able to be here tonight. He graduated from Oak Grove in 1970. 
born in Hong Kong. He came to the United States to study at Oak Grove. And he gives our school credit for his becoming an American citizen and, and a businessman in the Chicago area. His current investments involve a variety of apartment buildings and he's retired from his other aspects of his business and enjoys his time doing maintenance on those many, several apartment buildings. He's married and has several children. And uh, he shared his story with Eric Loki uh, some time ago. Thank you very much, all of you, for being a part of the Legacy Partners. We are very grateful for your support. I'd like to uh, take this moment, before I introduce the president, I, want, I do have to share that you should have seen his face when I said this was the 110th Oak Grove Annual Dinner. Just the look on his face was priceless. But I'd like to introduce our president, Mike Sledding. <laughs> Eric's, uh, Eric's very entertaining because I think he reads my face better than anybody I know. Uh, maybe even including my wife. Um, so it makes working with Eric really interesting because what I think apparently comes out of my face before it ever comes off my, out of my mouth. But, uh, we're just so pleased that you're here tonight for this, uh, for this uh, Celebrating the Mission annual dinner. Uh, I'm not going to take long here because I get to come up again in just a few moments. Uh, but I want to reiterate some of the things that you've heard already tonight. Uh, this mission at Oak Grove is unique. Uh, it's been unique for a long time. Uh, what, since its uh, beginning in 1906? I don't know if they would have captured it in the words that we use now. But I think about the, uh, the Bible verse where Jesus uh, was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. We took that and we turned it into a mission statement. And that mission statement centers on rigorous academics, on an expectation of growing faith, and then on an orientation of creating servant leaders, as uh, Tom talked about earlier tonight. And it is unique. We, uh, we live in a community and a part of the country that has fabulous public schools. No one here in the room, I don't think, would argue with that. But we get to do something different because we get to blend faith and service into that day-to-day -day experience. And I'm happy to share with you that this mission is drawing more students to Oak Grove than we have ever had in the school's history. Uh, think of these two numbers. 560 kids in kindergarten through grade 5, or grade 12, oh, grade 5, thank goodness we don't have that many. <laughs> no. K-12, 560. Uh, the previous record was, uh, oh, about 10 years ago at uh, 468. We keep setting records. On top of that, add more than 90 students uh, that are 3, 4, and 5-year-olds uh, as part of our Chose Early Learning Center. We have 650 kids that show up every week and get nurtured by this Oak Grove experience. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, it's, it shapes young people in ways that I don't think they will even necessarily recognize until perhaps they leave. But um, we just know it's going to be awesome. And uh, you know, I think the uh, two words that I think that, that are part of the Oak Grove experience would be context and perspective. And if you would, uh, just think with me for a moment, because the world tells us that we have access to all of the world's information at our fingertips, which is pretty much true. But information doesn't equal knowledge, and knowledge doesn't equal wisdom. And what context and perspective that comes from our faith and our sense of serving others, all of a sudden takes information and makes it, it is sort of ubiquitous, right? But life is more than just access to information. What do you do with it? And I think our mission statement challenges our students to grow in that context and perspective 
and grounded in their faith turns them into young people that they simply wouldn't be without that experience. So I think it gives them a level of understanding and uh, shaping of our world in ways that can make us all proud and hopeful. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to stop because I get to come back in just a few moments to introduce uh, our uh, Living the Mission Henri tonight. But in the uh, meantime, we're going to hear from two of our special students. Uh, these happen to be sisters, as is noted on your uh, program here. We have Kellen and Remy, who um, one day will convince their younger sister to also join them. Uh, this is a wonderful family, reflective of Oak Grove in so many ways because these are active young ladies across a broad spectrum. So please welcome the duet of the Singing Oceans by Hillsong United. particular award for 110 years, at least I don't think so, Eric. But I do believe we have been recognizing Living the Mission Award honorees for about 25 years. And if we could pause for a moment, uh, I, I know we have some uh, former honorees in the room. Would those uh, people stand and be recognized? Uh, it, it just helps put a little history to this. Look at this. tonight to, in, to introduce the uh, Living the Mission honoree this evening. And tonight, unlike uh, the last several years, uh, we have only one honoree. Uh, but I think that you will get a sense that, uh, that this one carries the weight of maybe even two or more. Uh, this is quite a life story. Chaplain and Brigadier General Thomas Soljum spent two years at Oak Grove and I'm guessing he's going to share a, a broader family history and connection to Oak Grove, but it is quite long and quite impressive. Uh, I believe that he shared last night that he was here under both the encouragement and probably the financial generosity of his grandfather, the grandparents, and that is also the case for many students today who probably wouldn't do it without the help of that next generation 
that makes it possible. I listened, uh, we, we had the uh, opportunity to spend dinner together last night, and I heard a living testimony to the value of mentoring, both as an influence on his life and significantly you will hear on his ability to mentor and influence others since that, since his early days. You've seen the details of his career uh, that started, um, well, at Oak Grove and uh, one of the early enlistees into the volunteer army. Uh, it's a long, awesome uh, history here. What stood out for me last night was this uh, revelation that when you are part of a ranger group or a special operations group, you're not the chaplain that sits back and prays for them as they head off. You're actually with them. Uh, the only difference is you don't carry a weapon. You go with the power of prayer. And it's powerful. And you're going to hear stories tonight, I think, in some of the sharing of uh, an incredible faith that grew deeper through his life experiences. Some of the words that were used to describe Tom Soldier were spiritual, knowledgeable, relational, and energetic. And you're going to hear that and more this evening from this, uh, from this gentleman. Uh, Tom was quick to point out that in 1977 he married his childhood sweetheart, who uh, is also from this area, uh, Jill Wal Wahlberg, and describes Jill as an absolute partner in ministry and every bit as called and committed as himself. And there are stories about how his uh, chaplaincy that would call so much on his faith also called on her leading faith um, uh, and hope building processes as someone who stayed home and served uh, the people that were part of that community but, but home. So, to many of Chaplain Soljan's honors, we are pleased to add tonight uh, that, that he has not only this distinguished career serving his country and his Lord, but we look to him as an incredible example of Oak Grove Lutheran School living its mission as we're called to do. So would you please help me welcome and congratulate Chaplain Thomas Soldier as our living commission And uh, when uh, 
we have a front office that handle the screening things for you, and so they come in. Uh, I don't know when the phone call was received, but then they come in and they say, okay, these are the things in your schedule. Oh, by the way, your high school is called, and they want to give you an award, and I, I thought somebody was playing a practical joke. <laughs> Uh, but it turns out it wasn't, and so I, I don't take these things lightly, and I give all glory and credit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, because without Him, we really are nothing and can do nothing. And I, there's a verse of Scripture that I'd like to share with you this evening. Um, it's Israel in the state of captivity. There, it's in the book of Jeremiah. Um, and it really speaks to our family, and it speaks to my heart about what God wants to do in your life. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. And if you look to me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. And I'll be found by you, says the Lord. That encapsulates a huge truth. That God has a plan and purpose for our life, and sometimes we're slow to get on the right path. And so what I would like to talk to you about this evening is that path and that journey. Um, it's, uh, it's a little difficult uh, or imposing when your family is sitting here as you're telling your story. Because they know you better than most of the rest in the room. But I'm going to press through this anyway. So, what I would like to also recognize, there's a couple of uh, classmates here this evening who are probably in a cadre of astonishment as well, but I would like to uh, ask uh, Stan Grassgard and Dan Eastfold if you please stand. Class of 74, Dan graduated with me. He was also the best man in our wedding, and Stan was a year later. So thank you, gentlemen, for honoring me with your presence here this evening. So what I'd like to talk to you about, uh, I want to start out, we, we kind of did the family uh, research of how many had attended Oak Grove. So relatives, shirt tail relatives, married into the family, uh, there's about 35 from our family that have attended Oak Grove over the years. It started with my grandmother in 1926, my father, who's gone on to, um, to the Lord uh, in 49 and then other family members and extended family members. So we've got a long history with Oak Grove. Um, and as I stand here this evening and reflect upon the years, as um, when I got word that I was receiving this, um, it was around noon, it was about close to noon, and so I had some reflective time, I ate my lunch, and I began to think about the journey. I, my view is in the Pentagon, and I look out of the Pentagon in my window. I am where the left wingtip of the aircraft that flew into the Pentagon uh, hit the building. That is where my office is. And right outside of my office is the memorial, so I'm reminded every day that I'm at work of the impact to our nation at a significant time in our history. I can also look out on beautiful Arlington National Cemetery. I can see the Lee House up on the hill. Um, it's a beautiful view and as I was reflecting and I was thinking about the journey and how I've arrived at this destination and how faithful the Lord has been. Um, and I just want to unpackage that for you a little bit this evening and I guarantee you I'll get you out of here by 10.30. <laughs> so this journey really starts with uh, investment of others um, it plays to a loving God who cares deeply about His creation and sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for sinful mankind. And I'm in that number. Sinful mankind. In need of His grace and love and mercy. And as I've, if I, as I've already enumerated, that He has plans and purposes not only to rescue us, but to fulfill His plans and purposes in our life that frankly are beyond our ability to comprehend because uh, Dan, I know you and I would not have envisioned this day being a reality in either of our lives, how good God has been. And so it's the investment of others, it's the investment of a loving God, it's the investment of family, 
It's the investment of friends. It's the investment of people of influence who've mentored. And as I'm unpackaging this this evening, think about the people in your life, on your journey, that have touched you. And organizations of influence, the body of Christ, being raised um, in a context where the gospel is proclaimed and declared. What a privilege to live in a place like that. And then we have the opportunity to come to Oak Grove and I would say that you know some of my, uh, some of my uh, teachers and coaches are here this evening and I would think they would qualify me as a bumpy start. A bumpy start. So I was not exactly the model of perfection as a student at Oak Grove. I didn't sing in the choir. I was an okay wrestler. Mr. Haggins told me I was an okay football player. I was just kind of average. And the beauty of that is, is God uses just ordinary people to do for Him and on His behalf extraordinary things. Um, you think of the investment of people, and then I, I reflect on the military and my military experience. Um, so if you're here this evening, let me just stop right here. And if, if you've had a hand in my life, I want to thank you. Whether you're a member of my family, or whether you're someone here from Oak Grove, or a friend, I just want to thank you for the influence that you've had in my life. And the military for me, as I left Oak Grove, Oak Grove was a real gift. Um, if you recall that period of history, where, where we were, we were coming out of Vietnam, our nation was in turmoil, our culture and our society was, uh, I would say, evaporating of sorts. Um, and then the context to find yourself in a place like Oak Grove, it was, it was a refuge in that world. It wasn't perfect, but it was a refuge and developed some great relationships with people that have sustained themselves over the years. But uh, like I said, it was a bumpy start, so I'm not here to present a pretty picture. And then that bumpy start got even bumpier as I entered into military service as a young soldier as the volunteer army was starting up in the Vietnam era was winding down, um, finding myself displaced, really misoriented in my life purpose and living in a way that uh, I'm not proud of. I um, mean, in that context, um, this, my life began to really unravel and in, in an African-American medic named Doc McElroy um, this is, begins to now show you how God has plans and they are unfolding in ways you can't even envision. So he was a deacon in the gospel church. He was Church of God in Christ background. Um, he had an effervescent smile and he had two gold teeth. So when he smiled, it smiled back at you. And he had a countenance, he had something in him that was just uniquely different. He was always humming a ditty. He was always singing some kind of Christian song. Um, he was always pleasant. He took an interest in me. Um, he saw this young man adrift and he just took an interest in me. And I'm going to, for the sake of time so that we can get out of here by 1030, I'm going to cut right to the shape of that relationship. And, and um, I really needed the Lord in my life in an active way. And he knew it. And he saw it. And he loved, he just simply loved me. I've heard great music this evening and witness to the fact of our active role as Christians in the world and, and making a difference. Well, Dr. McElroy made a huge difference. Um, and on the February day in uh, 1976, um, I knelt down in an army barracks and I said, Jesus, I give my life to you, fresh and new. Forgive me for the things that I have embraced in life and, and help me to live a life of service for you. You need to be careful when you pray. And God showed up and, um, and Doc McElroy was not, uh, he realized that uh, if you don't remember that culture, that was a lot of time during a lot of racial tension. So blacks and whites didn't necessarily hang out together. 
As a matter of fact, there was a lot of hostility. And Doc McElroy pressed through all of those barriers because he was a man with a mission. He was a servant of the Most High God and he was there to be a witness. But he saw that this package was a little bit more than he could deal with. So he handed me off to a chaplain, Sam Sanford, and his wife Linda took me into their home. And they loved me. And they accepted me for who I am. A data point to show you how God is into details, if you don't know that God is into details, like every detail. As that relationship unfolded, and he was from Minnesota, and we began to explore our lineage and history, it turns out that his cousin, Galen Osi, was the pastor of Zion Luther Church, where I attended as a young boy. That's details. That's God. He majors in the minor. Does things right. That relationship then took really a transformational shape, and I'm talking about investment right now, and that's only my first point. People make an investment. Oak Grove made an investment in me. I'm not certain that I gave the return that Oak Grove deserved. I'm confessing if you haven't kind of figured it out. I entered the service and I'm not confident that the service got the return that they should have for me as a young soldier. But in the midst of that, God saw potential that I didn't see in myself. And He called me to serve Him. And it, what's kind of interesting, I said, you know, be careful what you pray. So I was sitting in a chapel one day in Germany and I, I did not want to stay in the army. I wanted to, when I, when my uh, time of departure from the service was about to arrive. I did not ever want to enter military service again. And uh, I was sitting in a chapel. It was kind of a haven for me. I went there at noon. And uh, I was sitting there contemplating the future and wondering what I would do. And I wanted to kind of demonstrate my commitment to the Lord, saying all things, all options were on the table. And because the chaplain Sanford had such an influence in my life, I said, Lord, I I just want to serve you, I would do anything. And then I paused and I thought, what can I really say that would demonstrate change? I said, I'd even be a chaplain. Voila. <laughs> Go figure. So that's how the investment of significant people, family, praying for others loving me, making that investment, then opened up the door of really opportunities and you can read all that stuff but that's really God's story unfolding those opportunities uh, took a lot of different shapes but the door to those opportunities were found in faith and forgiveness in Matthew 25 there's the parable of the talents you're all familiar with it so to one was given five, to another two, and to another one. And then there was an accounting for those talents. So God has given us each talents, opportunities, and how, what, we've, what have we done with the investment and how have we served? As I'm reflecting over my life's experience, I don't know if I was the one or the two or the five. But God invested in me and in friends like you. I'm just trying to make good on the return. Because we all know that we're going to make count one day for the talents that we've been given and what we've done with them. And there's this calling to serve. Calling to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in my case, a dual calling to serve men and women in uniform. And this has been just an absolute wonderful experience. I couldn't put a price tag on it. I know if Jill were up here, she would be right there attesting to. We have gotten back more than I think we've ever given from our time in service. We serve, have the privilege of serving with some of the finest men, men and women who volunteer and put themselves at risk. Put themselves at risk so that we can live as a free people. I, last evening, um, we were privileged to 
share with, uh, have Hiram share with us some things with us. Um, and that other generation um, who just went, and they didn't volunteer, they got drafted. And uh, as he shared experiences of, of God's hand in protecting him and watching over him in harm's way. I'm not here this evening to really to tell you a lot of war stories. There are plenty of them, but I will tell you a few. Share a few. In answering that call to serve, I'm reminded at the Bible college that I attended, there was a sign um, over the door post from Mark 10, 45. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. A call to service. Men and women in, in uniform embody that verse of Scripture. That they're willing to lay down their lives so that others can live. Those are the kind of people that you get to serve with. And some of them are no longer here. Some of them have irreparable uh, conditions that they face, impairments. But they do it for love of their country and love of their God. And as an officer, um, we have a unique place in the formation. So let me give you some context to what it is to be called to serve as an officer and a chaplain. So on the one hand, you're accountable to your faith group or you're accountable to your God to live your faith in the formation. And I just want to put you at ease. You know, I get asked all kinds of questions like, are, are religious freedoms being inhibited? Are you able to, you know, be open and transparent? Absolutely. It's the most rewarding, enriching experience that one can imagine. And soldiers are, there's no, uh, the adage, uh, no atheists in foxholes, I can validate that. <laughs> Life-threatening conflict will bring people to their senses about their eternal destiny. And to be privileged to serve with them and to be able to offer life, a message of life, and hope and grace of a God who cares for them, who loves them, is just the most rewarding thing that one could ever participate in. I'm going to share two stories with you. Um, I, uh, I was in Afghanistan um, early on, so when nine, after 9-11 occurred, we deployed right away. I was in the Ranger Regiment and it's no notice deployment. So Jill's lived through some, she's the one you really ought to talk to. She's got the story to tell. So if you can imagine, you know, you, you, you go to work and all of a sudden your husband's gone, you don't know where he is, and you turn on the television set and you, you figure out that he's gone, but you have no means of communication. That takes a special person to live that kind of calling. It really does. Um, so I can't say enough of the family. It's so, so very important. And to have a partner who understands it and who's committed like you are to that calling. Uh, it's a wonderful gift. But when we deployed, if you remember in context, if you remember when Osama bin Laden was in the mountains of Afghanistan, this was in, in uh, early in 2002, um, and there was an operation to go and get, and get him. Uh, that was our, my organization. And... Um, uh, that mission didn't go well. The initial entry uh, had problems. They were shot out of the air. Um, and, uh, and then they sent in a group to rescue. So let me, that's setting the context, so let me now tell you a very quick story about what chaplains do. So there's a, what we call a quick reaction force. Those are the people who are waiting for bad things to happen and then they're gonna go help. Everybody with me? I'm avoiding military jargon. Am I doing okay? Okay, good. So if I throw an acronym out there, you hold me accountable for it. So now QRF is Quick Reaction Force. Okay, they answer when bad things happen. So the Quick Reaction Force, the chaplain of that unit, the battalion unit, so that's subordinate to me, um, held a service. Um, and these soldiers come from all walks of life. And many don't come from a faith background or orientation. Many come from broken homes and families. And so the chaplain, um, knowing that they're in a very life-threatening, serious business, um, 
they had a worship service that evening. He shared the gospel with them and asked if there any was any in the group that needed to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, one young uh, ranger named Commons brought three friends with him. And they all that evening made a profession of faith. Three hours later on a QRF mission, they all died. That's what chaplains do. They're on the cutting edge. They're there. They're faithful. They're presenting the gospel. They're living out their faith before men and women in uniform. Um, and we have wonderful relationships. Wonderful relationships. And one other thing I would just share with you in context is um, how important it is. Um, it's kind of a little humorous piece. I could tell other stories, some I would rather not repeat, but this one was humorous. And this shows you how soldiers look up to you. And uh, I was in a joint task force, so joint means that you have all services represented. So you have Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marines. And a special operations community, that would be operators, SEALs, that kind of caliber of people. So out of the operations center one day, and this is in Baghdad, so it's about 120 degrees. It's hot, and we do missions at night. So we do what we call reverse cycle, meaning we sleep or we work out, we eat during the day, and we go out at night. And we use the hour and the cover of darkness to do the missions. So one morning after, you know, all this, I was in my, my gear, we call it battle rattle, so you're in your, you have your body armor and your web gear and all that stuff on. And I was, I had been up for about almost 72 hours, no sleep. How many of you feel good after 72 hours of no sleep? And I was sweating profusely and I was, and I had a little, water bottle, and it must have looked terrible. And a gunny sergeant came out of the operations center, and he goes, Chaps! He goes, are you okay? I go, yeah, gunny, I think so. He goes, you look terrible. And Chaps, you can't look bad. Chaplains can't have a bad day. Because <laughs> that's how they see you. They see you as the effervescent person who brings a message of life, message of hope, message of peace, a calming influence in an organization. That's what chaplains do. I'm really telling their story for you this evening. So I want you to be reassured this evening that the chaplains that serve our military are wonderful people. They're dedicated people, they and their families, and the men and women who serve our country are, are they're absolutely the very best. Now I don't know where we are in time, but I think we're getting close to... Okay. And we're going to get out of here by 10.30. All right. So, what I want to conclude with is this. Um, God is completing His work in us. So I received this this evening, but it's really the investment of others is why I'm here. I can't take credit for any of it as much as I'd like to. It's really the investment of others. And now we just simply are living out, all of us, the opportunities that God has put before us in life. We're completing His plan in us. And when we serve, and when we concede to His will, that is where joy is. So I stand here this evening before you, um, amazed at what the Lord has done in my life and the people that he's used to perfect and continue to perfect me. My heart's full and overflows and I'm privileged to have had the opportunity to attend Oak Grove and I'm, to see what Oak Grove is becoming is a blessing. Thank you, Chaplain.
That was amazing. Thank you. What a special place this school is. I thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, before we invite uh, some closing remarks, we'll have uh, one more solo by uh, a freshman, Lauren Huff. To close us tonight, I'd like to invite former Oak Grove parent and Pastor Jim Borby. supposed to give a plug for Oak Grove, and that I shall do. When we came here in 1981, I still had three boys in school. And Nate, our oldest, who is now pastor in uh, Little Falls, uh, was having a hard time wondering, should I leave Roseville, where I've been in school for several years, and come up here with only a half a year to go? Well, we moved up here and he decided to come along. One month at Old Grove, he came up to me one evening and said, Dad, I wish we would have moved here sooner. <laughs> uh, you can't get better than that as an advertisement. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, I thank you that you have established Old Grove as a launching pad from which young men and young women take off to become salt and light in this dark world. I thank you that in this place they not only get sustenance for the mind but also for the soul. And so Lord, send them out into a world which is pretty topsy-turvy and somehow give them the courage of their convictions that with your help they can make a difference. Lord, bless the administration and the staff at this fine school and may they never give up on the students for they have so much potential within them. And so now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of his eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may know his will, and do that which is pleasing in his sight. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs>